So first up this morning, we're going to talk about pediatric procedural sedation. I have Dr. Lopez. He's an <coughs> associate professor in both emergency medicine and pediatric emergency medicine. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Lopez. All right. Um, quickly, I don't like to sit by the, the mic, so I'm going to move around a bit. If you can't hear me, I'd be surprised by that. But if you can't hear me, let me know. I'm going to try and go fairly quickly through this because I have to do this in 30 minutes and usually my lecture is around an hour, hour and a half. So we're going to move it along. I have no conflicts of interest. I don't own anything that I know of, at least in a drug company. You know, it's in one of those, you know, large group things, maybe under my uh, 403B, but otherwise I don't know. All right, procedural sedation. So what is procedural sedation? Remember, we want to use the word procedural sedation. The ideal protocol would allow rapid induction, emergence, maintain effective, you can read all this, but there's no such agent that's been found to date. So, but this is what we want. Procedural sedation has replaced the term conscious sedation because you don't want the patient to be conscious, okay? So try and use the word procedural sedation. There's a much better reimbursement that way. Examples, yeah. I think you all pretty, under, pretty much understand what do we use procedural sedation for and lots of stuff. In children, it's almost, I'd say the vast majority is going to be the fractures and all that. But even when we have to do the pediatric sexual assault exams that we do over the Children's Hospital of Georgia, or sometimes a CT MRI, I got to knock them down. So if I got to knock them down, we're going to say procedural sedation. All right, sedation of pediatric patients has serious associated risks, of course. Hypoventilation, the apnea, airway obstruction, laryngospasm, and then some sort of cardiopulmonary impairment. Whenever you sedate somebody, you need to be prepared for any of this. This is what you know. This is my magic wand. I always put out something, the ET tube, something like that, next to the bed because if I got my magic wand, I won't need it. Okay. If you forget to put your magic wand out, I guarantee you something's going to go bad. Guard the patient's safety and welfare, minimize physical discomfort. Remember, some of these things don't have analgesia. They'll, they'll sedate, but they won't have analgesia, and we'll talk about that. Control anxiety, psychological trauma, especially in the sexual assault exams. Control behavior. Behavior meaning, you know, a three-year-old just isn't going to sit for you. I mean, he doesn't want you to touch you. It doesn't really matter if he's got a ginormous laceration on his arm. He just doesn't want you to touch him. Control behavior, right? return the patient to a state from which safe discharge for medical supervision. So you know you're going to have to hold the kid at least for a little while afterwards. Indications, what do we do? We, well, we want to induce a state that allows the patient to tolerate whatever unpleasant procedure we're doing. We want to uh, include, you know, all these things. I'm going to kind of go through things real quick. Most common specified procedures, I said this earlier, were uh, fractures, the shoulder reductions, and lacerations. So in the ProSed registry, when they look at the most common pediatric procedures, these are the ones that we tend to do the most, at least in the emergency department. Terminology. Pain, defined as both having sensory and emotive components. We haven't yet, and this is my lifelong goal, is to develop the painometer, okay, so that I can just sit there and scan somebody and say, look, man, you got nothing, get out, okay? But I haven't yet done that. Sometime in my life, I hope to. I'm sure I'll, you'll never see me again because I'll own my own island after that. <laughs> the unpleasant stimulus has the potential to cause tissue damage and is exacerbated by fear and anxiety. The purpose of procedural sedation is to control the emotive component while at the same time allowing for analgesia for the uncomfortable stimulus. Lots of words essentially to knock the kid down. Analgesia is a reduction of uh, or relief from pain. So we want both. Just because we're sedating, we're not necessarily doing the analgesia. So remember to try and get both things, and I'll show you my favorite drugs are the ones that do both. And then anesthesia is usually a drug which is administered to provide amnesia, reduce the level of consciousness, analgesia, relaxation of the body's musculature without having a detrimental effect. The patient's physiological cardio respiratory stability. All right, so sedation simply reflects a reduction of that. Minimal sedation. We, you can do minimal sedation, but for the most part, minimal sedation is more of an anxiolysis dose, so this is going to be maybe intranasal versed or something along that line. It's not exactly what I was shooting for for this lecture, because we're trying to go for procedural sedation, but here's a, uh, a term for minimal sedation. Moderate sedation, 
A sedation in which the patient responds purposely to verbal commands with or with the addition of a light touch or stimulus. Really, in pr uh, procedural sedation, that's not what I want either. I don't want them to respond to a light touch or verbal, because that's not what I'm going for. If I'm going for CT scan, okay, maybe, you know, they'll sit for me for that. But we want deep sedation. So a level of sedation in which the patient is not easily aroused, but does respond purposely with a significantly uncomfortable stimulus. And that's where I get my NLGs in the Patient with this level may require medical intervention to maintain an airway, which is why you gotta be prepared for this. This patient also maintains their baseline cardiovascular function. It's not until I get to general anesthesia, which we will not be doing in the emergency department, refers to a patient that is unable to be aroused with verbal or painful. These patients often need help in maintaining their airway, require positive pressure ventilation, uh, patient's cardiovascular function may be negatively affected. So we don't seek to the general anesthesia. We want deep sedation. Paperwork-wise, I would write deep sedation as when I'm getting my consent. That's, that's my point. That's where I want the parent to understand. That's how far I want to get to. JACO standards. JACO hurts us. Main reason it hurts us is this. One ED uh, physician provider for the sedation is separate from the per person performing the procedure. So even though in most emergency departments when you're doing a laceration repair, you're doing a laceration and you're sedating. Unfortunately, per JACO, you're not supposed to be doing that and therefore the reimbursement becomes a problem, okay? If at all possible, if you have another person, you know, you want to get the other person to at least start the sedation and then you can build for both. If you have a mid-level, you want to have yourself doing the sedation, that's the higher billing one, and having the mid-level doing the procedure. That's the better way to capture all of your, all of your, uh, your charges. We have residents, the resident is not a, 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 a faculty member and therefore can't be charged either. So typically we end up losing half of this, you know, in, uh, at the Children's Hospital of Georgia. But anyways, if you're going to bill one, go for the sedation. The sedation is almost always the higher of the charge. Fasting. So how long should we fast the, the children? This has never been determined. You know, anesthesia, and I'll show you in a minute, came up with an idea, but the American College of Emergency Physicians defined this guidelines based on sound evidence are lacking because of a paucity of ED studies about pre-procedural fasting. So we don't really know. The one thing I tell you, if you ever send somebody to another hospital, if you're going to have them, just tell them don't stop at McDonald's on the way. This has been a, I don't know what that is, you know, they're coming from Burke County or something. For me to fix a laceration, they stop at McDonald's on the way. The moment they stop at McDonald's, it's done. I can't do it. It's going to have to be three hours. That's a heavy load of greasy food. I'm really not in the mood of seeing that coming at me, okay? so. Ask them, you know, what'd you eat last? You know, if it's a big, bad, heavy, fat food, you might want to push for the whole three hours, okay? If they just had their milk, their formula, for example, that's going to be gone in an hour. You've got plenty of time. So these guys, anesthesia published this guidelines, but it was based on a consensus from patients. So they just asked patients, hey, how long did you not eat before you went for your procedure? And that's where they came out with their numbers. So it really doesn't have a whole lot of basis in, in fact. JACO, uh, they just say that the facility must develop a standardized protocol that's used, uh, utilized during procedural sedation. So if you're on your <clears throat> committee at your hospital, try and go for the three hour rule. Around two to three hours is great. That usually works out pretty well. The amount of time a patient must fast before a procedure is not defined. All right. Studies performed using uh, pediatric in emergency department, the risk of adverse outcomes were with limited pre-sedation fasting, including pulmonary aspiration was extremely low. So, and it makes sense. I mean, I look at my trauma patients. Most of them have just come from McDonald's too when they get into the car wreck. And yet I'm able to intubate them without huge amounts of problems. So most of the time, this isn't gonna be as much of an issue for us. All right, so pre-sedation assessment, just quickly, I, we tend to use the ample history, which is that allergies, medications, past, last meal, events leading up to. Ask for psychiatry. Anybody associated, I like ketamine, and we'll go back to that, but psychosis associated with ketamine and psychosis in the family associated with ketamine. Past anesthesia history, including that family history, 
anybody that took a long time to come out of sedation, that's one of my common questions. Did you ever have someone in the family that you know couldn't wake up for a day? That might be one to understand. Cardiac arrest with induction or paralysis, allergies, and then remember your propofol is egg and soy. Okay, so if you have allergies there, you really should uh, need to consider a different drug. This is the way to look into the mouth. You really want to be somewhere in these two guys, class one, class two. Look externally, manipulate, malum potty score, obstructions, neck mobility. In the adults, you use the two fingers. In the children, you really want to see more of the mouth because they tend to have the bigger tongue, so you want to be somewhere in there at least. All right. So class one, ASA class classification, in other words, are they healthy? <laughs> yeah, class one, they don't have anything. They're, they're great, normal health, nothing really amazing there. Class two, mild systemic disease that you can handle. Mild asthma, controlled diabetes, currently controlled diabetes, okay? If their blood sugar is 600, you really wanna probably control that first before you start doing something else. Class three now, you get into some more severe things, and then four and five. These two, unless it's emergent, class five, unless it's emergent, we're never gonna do four and five in the emergency department. That's one that you'd really wanna consider getting your anesthesia consult. Class three, maybe, depending on how bad this disease is, and class one and two, you really should be able to handle. All right, so my favorite drug is ketamine. I like Special K, I think this works very well, okay? <clears throat> it's a dissociative agent, it includes a state of catalepsy, it provides sedation, analgesia, amnesia. It acts by inhibiting the reuptake of the catecholamines, and then for, therefore it produces this mild to minor increase in the blood pressure, heart rate, cardiac output, a little bit more in the oxygen con consumption, so I usually put my children onto a bit of oxygen. Stimulates the salivary, and tracheal bronchial secretions. For the most part, this is not a big problem for your average kid. The ones who are much smaller, and this is somewhat controversial, but under the age of five with asthma, that's when you really should consider using something to dry them up a little bit. Antisialagog, atropine, glycopyrrolate. Atropine is pretty common in the emergency department, so I tend to use atropine. But my own um, practice is a child under five with significant asthma, I'm gonna go ahead and give him the atropine prior to doing the ketamine. Again, this is controversial. There are some studies that show that that's not actually true, but you know, you always treat based on your last worst experience, right? So my last worst experience had a kid with a lot of secretions that I then therefore had to chase after. So I'm probably gonna do that forever. Advantages. It can be done IM or IV, okay? advance uh, avoidance of the ET uh, intubation because it maintains their airway. They breathe fine. Unless you really give them way too much, they're still going to be breathing. Reliability and production of potent analgesia, sedation, and amnesia. Okay, so this is what is important to me. This has analgesia and sedation. So one drug, I'm getting both deals, which is why I like to use the ketamine. Adverse reactions, nightmares. The older children tend to have the nightmares upon emergence, okay? So you're bringing them out, a teenager, sometimes a, a younger adult starts screaming about snakes or something else. Be aware of that. It's not a terrible thing. You can give them a little Ativan or Versed to prolong the, the recovery, and they usually do very, very well. Unpleasant recovery, their agitation. This is mostly in adults. Emesis. It says only six to seven percent, but I, I seem to see that fairly eh, frequently, you know, an hour later when I'm about to discharge them and they get up and then they throw up. So remember the emesis and then laryngospasm. This is only 0.4 percent, but unfortunately I've seen this. This is very, very freaky when you have somebody who's completely otherwise asleep, the saturation is fine, everything looks good, but they're making the noise. They're sitting there going, eh, eh. you know, and Everyone's looking because it sounds awful. The ringospasm maneuver, okay? I want to do this, uh, I want to show you all this because this works very well. As this man, is, uh, or this person I should say, is doing the notch behind, oops, a minute. There you go, there you go. The notch behind the mandible itself, you push and you hold. 
You hold, you hold, you hold. There's a little bit of a jaw thrust associated with it, and that will stop the laryngospasm. I've tried to find a name for this. Somebody had a name for it, but I think he just named it after himself. But this maneuver goes back to the 1920s, and it never has a name associated with it. Very, very good. This worked fantastically for me the time that I had the laryngospasm on the patient. So remember it, laryngospasm notch, you got your finger right there, you push in, lift up a little bit with the jaw thrust and the and that noise goes away, everybody takes a deep breath, the mom's fine, and we keep on going. Okay. Unpleasant hallucinations, dreams that occur, uh, more common in the older. The dosing range, one to four milligrams per kilo. Most people use one to two to start with, um, milligrams per kilo. If you're gonna go intramuscular, you're essentially doubling it. <coughs> Propofol, intravenous hypnotic that is uh, produced in a soy-based emulsion and made <coughs> and contains this, soybean and egg less the thin and glycerol. You need to remember the allergies. It looks like, it looks like milk. So I try to remember it, you know, sort of along that lines. It has a very rapid onset of action with a loading dose of two to two. 0.5 milligrams per kilo, achieving unconsciousness within 10 to 50 seconds of intravenous uh, administration. So it's really, really fast. It does a very good job of knocking them down, but the, I understand there's many hospitals that won't allow the emergency department to use propofol. Actually, most hospitals won't let the nurse push the propofol, so now it becomes this giant deal you're, you're, you got your gloves on because you're going to do the laceration, you want the sedation, you can't order the nurse to do it because you have to push it, so it becomes a problem. It's a good drug, but it has all these associated issues that make it kind of not all that useful for us. Attractive anesthesia and sedation, rapid distribution and elimination following a single bolus injection, so it's in and out pretty darn fast. It has an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, mild bronchodilating capabilities, so remember that in your asthma patients. It's also, uh, if you have a really bad asthma, you can give a propofol to both calm them down and open up his airways. The action right here, this big long word, uh, demonstrate usefulness in the management of refractory seizures and severe delirium, delirium tremens as well. Mechanism is poorly understood, likely to cause action on the lipid membrane. Uh, highly protein bound, undergoes rapid distribution into the brain and other tissues. It's metabolized by the liver, so if you have a patient who has liver disease, that's not exactly the greatest drug to use. Distribution half-life, one to eight minutes with a metabolic clearance of 30 to 50 minutes. This is a complete all out, you know, out of your body kind of thing. Children, of course, always have a more rapid metabolism than the adults. If you, I'm sure you've all uh, tried to sedate children. You always seem to give them gi giant amounts of doses compared to uh, adults, pretty much in everything. You give them a little Versed, they look at you like you're, you're just playing them, right? You know, you give them four, eight, you know, most adults would be unconscious. You'd have the tube and they're sitting there playing and crying if you get near them. Just remember, it takes a little bit extra. You can always give more, you just can't give less, right? So you go a little bit, doesn't work, you give them a little more, it doesn't work, you give them a little more, you just can't take it away. All right, propofol, however, is a hypnotic agent with no analgesic properties, okay? You need to remember that it doesn't control the pain associated, which now leads us to, we gotta, if I'm doing a reduction, I gotta give them something for pain, and therefore my sedation is a little bit deeper has been used on its own with a previous sedation dose of a narcotic. Fentanyl tends to be the one that most people use. It's a little faster. With similar outcomes, analgesia should be administered during painful procedures, either during or soon after sedation for the procedure. So propofol to me is a good one when I want to sedate this CAT scan or something like that. But beyond that, I don't like to use it because then I have two drugs. But that's my own feeling on that. Most common adverse effect is dosage-dependent hypotension. So you, you gotta give pretty decent dose in order to get the hypotension. Just remember that it can result in this smooth muscle basal uh, dilatation and therefore you get a little bit of a hypotension. The blunted sympathetic activity, you get some re uh, reduced tachycardia as a result of diminished baroceptor response. 30% of the children in a study had hypotension. I have all these studies, but I didn't include that because that again would take much too long. 
Propofol-induced hypotension seems to be transient, so if you wait a little bit, of course, propofol is pretty fast, so if you wait a little bit, everything goes away. Ketofol. Ketofol has now come out as the, the thing, right? You mix your ketamine associated with the propofol. So you can do a syringe mixture, one to one, 10 milligrams per ml of ketamine associated with a 10 milligrams per ml of propofol, and therefore you have ketofol. You use 0.5 milligrams to one milligram per kilo of the mixture, okay? So that will now give you the benefits of both and the problems of both. Now you've got some pain relief and you got wrap it on and wrap it off. So I did, I just took out a study here. 219 <coughs> patients with a median age of 13 years Primarily for orthopedic injuries, 13 years is pretty much what you find. Median dose of medication administered was 0.8, so somewhere in between those two. Ketamine and sedation was effective in all patients. So three of the patients had airway events requiring intervention, of which one required positive pressure ventilation. Two patients had an unpleasant <coughs> emergence requiring uh, treatment, so that's the ketamine pro part probably. And the mean recovery time was 14 minutes. So the two together seem to be very well, but you still have the problem of the propofol, hospital problem I mean, in that you have to be the one who pushes it because it has the propofol. I suspect most hospitals won't even mix this for you and you'll have to be the one who mixes it as well. Not a terrible, terribly hard thing to do, but again, another uh, labor intensive stuff for us. There are some places where you can actually have the ketofol ready to go. Nitrous oxide. Laughing gas, put it on your nose, that kind of thing. Dissociative gas provides mild to moderate procedural anxiolysis, analgesia, amnesia, in a linear dose uh, response pattern. So, this, for the most part, is. Oops, too fast. So, this, for the most part, is the anxiolysis. Typically blended with oxygen, it comes in those little roll around things with two, uh, two gases on there. Um, Recommended as a level A recommendation by the clinical policy for ASAP at a concentration of 50%. If you remember 50, that's pretty much all you want to do. Don't go past 50, now you're giving a lot of gas and not enough oxygen, okay? Nitrous oxide has both opioid agonist and methyl, that long word, NDMA, uh, receptor agonist effects. Most healthy patients have minimal cardiovascular or respiratory effects, advantages, the onset, five minutes, does not require an IV. That's something that many people prefer because it doesn't require an IV. Does require that special delivery device, so your hospital may not actually have that for you. Uh, adverse effects include emesis. It does uh, frequently have some emesis associated with it. Nausea, less extent to dizziness, euphoria, and dysphoria. I find this is probably the most common where they sit there and laugh, therefore the, the name and they tell me all sorts of crazy dreams and stuff that they're having. The problem that I have with, associated with this is typically what age can the child hold the nitrous oxide to their face, okay? That's gotta be under 12, at least, and probably even, you know, that might be difficult, because most kids are scared to begin with. You're not gonna get a seven-year-old to put the mask <laughs> on their face and hold it, okay? Because that's the requirement. You can't strap it on them. They have to hold it to their face and then once they're sedated, they kind of hands go off. So I don't, try, I don't tend to use nitrous oxide, and again, it doesn't really have that great effect for me either, but if you like it, go for it. It might actually be the good thing for you if you can't get an IV in a child. You might be able to at least do the nitrous oxide to sedate them, anxiolysis maybe enough so that you can get an IV. Versed, currently one of the most commonly used sedatives, drug for pre-medication, short acting, rapid, does not provide analgesic effect and is inadequate to prevent pain by more aggressive procedures. Mechanism of action is the GABA. Problems associated with the parental use, disturbances in respiratory function and hypoxemia. This was observed in 4.8% in one study. Other changes observed, hiccups. Versed causes a lot of hiccups. I don't know what that is about. And then paradoxical reactions where it, you wanted to sedate that child with the Versed and instead you've pretty much let them go free and their mind is going crazy and they're running around the room screaming. And that actually probably happens more frequently. Fentanyl, oral transmucosal fentanyl, that's the lollipop. Most places won't have that. If you do, rock and roll, use that one, that's a great drug. But most places aren't gonna have that for you. Uh, Pre-anesthetic, you can use that for when you're gonna place your IV. Most recently, it's been used in children for sedation during painful processes. 
complications of the transmucosal vomiting, pruritus, most of the time they sit there and they rub their nose a lot because of the pruritus of the face. Oxygen desaturation below 94. It's been rare, but it occurs. Remember, we want the children to be at 95, right? All the time. This is a very busy slide, but I tried to summarize that. So advantages, disadvantages, propofol, et cetera. Again, I, I prefer special K, but everybody has to choose their own thing, okay? All right, so I want you, I'm coming to the end here because I'm trying to move this along. We need to switch over, but this is my son. Okay, so when he was a tiger down here, he lost his two front teeth, so I just used that picture. But then, a year ago, he decides to play with his, I don't know, there's a bunch of kids in the house, something about he has his trumpet, somebody hits him in the face, so the trumpet goes into his teeth, okay? So now he breaks his teeth right down the middle there, which is terrible, but there was no pulp involved. Of course, it's on a weekend. You know, I think it was a holiday weekend just to, you know, really make it real well. And then my, uh, my dentist is on vacation. <laughs> I mean, it's just unbelievable. So he went around like this for a while. But he's healthy, so what would we use to sedate him? It's a relatively quick thing. All I'm going to be doing is maybe putting a little bonding agent here. We don't, you know... I'm not a dentist, I'm not going to be putting all that other stuff. I could put some cavit on there and maybe a little bit of the bonding agent. Fairly quick thing. What would we use to sedate them? What's a quick one? Anybody? Yeah, special K. <laughs> Ketamine might actually be a little aggressive for them because really I don't need all that much. You know, bursin would be probably reasonable. It's not all that bad. Um, I'm going to be pretty quick. Bonding agents don't really hurt. All right. Sedate this one, so laceration. Now, I took this off the internet. You can get all pictures off the internet, both good and bad. Down syndrome, no known cardiac disease, no allergies, no family history or problems with anesthesia. But we're gonna be doing a laceration on him, and he's a little bitty, so he's gonna be fighting us. So even though I use a papoose board, papoose, the strap him in there, or the sheets, it's still not gonna hold him. So, good drug for him. I know, special K. <laughs> Ketamine. Ketamine is actually a decent drug for this because it will give me uh, good sedation. It will also give me good pain control. He doesn't have cardiac disease, so therefore I'm okay as far as any kind of complications. Probably use that. You could use your propofol. I know Dr. Gordon here, he's a proponent of the ketofol. Might not be the best on this one, but that's all right. It can be done. This one. So sedate for fracture reduction. He has Pierre Robin syndrome. He has uh, many sedations without any problems. Mom has had a prolonged sleep after anesthesia. This we see, of course, at the Children's Hospital of Georgia because you know we're, that's where those, these folks are going to be having to go if you have severe malformations. So how would we sedate this child in the ER? Yeah, everybody's looking at me like, no, nope, I would not sedate this child in the ER. Okay. Way too many complications here. First off, the airway is going to be a nightmare. If you ever get that, I mean, that's the whole point of Pierre Robin, right? They don't have the jaw, so they have a very minimal uh, lower jaw, very, very small airway. I'm already giving you know, that he's had sedations without problems just to kind of make you feel better, but the mom also had this prolonged sleep after anesthesia. What does that mean? Is she, is she missing an enzyme and therefore can't come out? So this is one that I would certainly not want to sedate in the emergency department. I would consult anesthesia I would, or, or have the patient admitted, but I wouldn't want to be doing this one in the emergency department. It's okay to not be able to do things, okay? You don't have to get offended. You can even call me up for this and say, hey, I need to transfer this guy to the children's hospital. I'll say, rock and roll, let me get you with anesthesia. Because if you tell me Pierre Robin, I'm not going to be tubing that kid either. I'm not going to be sedating him. But, it's okay not to be able to do something, and most of the parents, I think, of a child with special needs understand that it might take a little bit more than what the average physician can do in the emergency department. But on the flip side, most kids are pretty easy, so don't be afraid of them, okay? They can, you know, if it takes them a long time to wake up, so what? You know, it's two in the morning, it's their nap time, you can give them another hour, you're there all night, right? You're probably the, the overnight person. You can wait. The parents will appreciate that more if you wait for them than if you try and scoot them out the door, okay? 